Well, I invite you to turn again to chapter 6 of the letter to the Hebrews. So let me begin reading with verse 3. Well, let me just start with verse 3 again because this, this is the third warning in the book of Hebrews. If you have a warning, that means you need to pay attention to it. I'm sure there were warnings given throughout Arkansas and Kentucky, and some paid attention, some did not. It's amazing to me when it comes to Scripture, you and I would prefer not to do it because we really don't live in the reality of the fact that we have eternal life, that our Savior is not only that for us, He is also the Master, the Lord, the ultimate authority in our life. So the writer to the Jewish believers is warning them. This is the third one he's given them. He's encouraging them to go up, grow up, go on to maturity, leave the elementary things behind. And then that verse 3, and I know I have emphasized this. I'm convinced there are a lot of people in churches that are in this verse. And that would explain why they're inconsistent, why they're not growing, because God has put them on a shelf. This we will do if God permits. Which would raise the question for all of us, why would God not permit this? He's talking to a group of believers that we've talked about so much in here, the Jewish Christians who've left Judaism, they've left family, they've left business, they're facing abandonment and persecution and ridicule, and some of them have come to the point of saying, what's the use in all of that? Let's go back unto Judaism, let's return to the temple traditions. And the writer is saying, don't do that. Let me see if I can draw this up here. I, I meant to ask before we got started, is there anybody in here certified in master life? Or are you, Lord? Okay, good, I need to know that. I... Here's a circle. That's your life. This is the life, this particular cir circle, is a life of a man or a woman, a young person, without Jesus Christ. Self is on the throne. But through the preaching of the Word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that individual begins to realize that they are lost without Christ. He died for them. He paid the sin debt. And they invite Jesus to come into their life. But when he comes into their life, if they're not discipled, if they don't understand the great salvation that the writer has been talking about in Hebrews, then they're not going to realize that he's not only Savior, he's Lord, he's Master, he's the ultimate authority, he's boss. He bought and paid for you. He owns you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. But we don't want to in put him on the throne of our lives we still want a little leeway so that we can do our own thing we can have our own objectives our own priorities oh we're going to heaven when we die and that's our insurance card that's your card that gets you out of hell but until you get to the destination of heaven you're going to do your own thing and that's the baby christian Never, ever take self off of the throne and put Jesus there. Grow up. When you came to Christ, you were born into the family of God, just like a physical baby. And I know I'm repeating this. But obviously, for a lot of people, it needs to be repeated. 
you were born into the family of God, and now you have the life of God on the inside of you. And Peter tells us he's given us everything that we need to grow in grace and knowledge. We're commanded to grow in grace and knowledge. We don't come into the kingdom and family of God full grown. It's a growth process. But we come to a point in our lives when we don't begin to see the great salvation and what's involved in that when we decide, I think I'll just stay where I am. I, I, I like what is happening in my life. I like knowing I'm going to heaven when I die, but I don't want all this authority in my existence. I will just do my own thing. And if you stay, and that's a choice we make, folks. We come to that point where we decide, I'm not going any further. And it's interesting as you go through the book of Hebrews, he gives us these five warnings. Don't do that. If you do it long enough, God's going to say to you, that's it. You will never go any further with me. I will put you on the shelf, but if you stay there long enough and you began to influence a lot of people, I'll just take you on home to heaven. And a lot of people don't believe that. Paul talks about that. John talks about that. A sin unto death. And that sin is not just one particular sin. It differs, with, differs from individual to individual. But you know that it's sin. We were talking a while ago about the fact that if you are a believer and you deviate from that path, the Holy Spirit will convict you, folks. That's one of the assurances you have that you are a Christian. It's killing me that I'm not going to be here next Sunday. My, my, my family... I just agonize over that. I, I, it's hard for me to grasp. I don't like to miss. This is my family. These Jewish believers had come to a point when they chose not to go on, not to go any further. I can remember when I was lifeguarding, you'd get those, you're teaching swimming lessons, and you'd get those children to the edge of the pool, and you would say, jump, jump, trust me, I will catch you, and you're in water that's up to your knees. Later. And then some of them would look at that and look at that and look at that and turn around and go the other direction. They didn't want to do that. Others were dog determined that they were going to do that. And they would take that step. And once they took that step, then that fear and that anxiety left them. And now they were on the road to learning how to swim. Except for one little boy that I had named Lester. Lester wasn't as big as a minute, but he was one of those determined children. So we were doing a little advanced training learning how, after you came to, to be a, learn how to swim, then how you rescued somebody from water. And we would take a, a lead anvil with a towel around it down to the deepest part of the pool, a drain, and leave it there. And then they had to go in down to that drain and pick that anvil up and bring it back to the surface. Lester went in, no fear in his body down to the drain and I could see him down there and he was such a little bitty piece of flesh he was down there pulling and pulling and pulling he couldn't move that anvil but he didn't want to give up I had to go in and get him he was turning blue down there what a vivid illustration of going on folks don't quit he said go on to maturity if you go, don't, you make a choice, God's going to just leave you there. You'll just go through all the motions. It'll mean nothing to you. What a warning he's given them. And then he adds another thing. For in the case of those, and again, these are believers. The Greek is very emphatic here. And the way the writer is identifying himself with these readers and then he calls them beloved, and then he'll switch away from a, 
a plural pronoun to singular. He's talking about them. If you stay there long enough, you are a partaker. You have eternal life. But you keep on and on and on. You're going to get to a point where it will be impossible for you to even repent of staying there. That's a scary place to be. You just get you. I'm, I get used to not being in church. If you've been there, folks, it's easier to miss, and the next time to miss, and the next time to miss, and the next time to miss, and you know that you're just in that pattern and that habit. And there will come a time the writer is saying he's not repentance to salvation. It's not what he's talking about. Growing and maturing, it'll be impossible to renew you unto repentance. You'll just stay in that place until you die and go to heaven or if you begin to affect a lot of people and you become that wrong influence to so many people, God will just take you on home. And he gives that illustration of ground that drapes up the rain and it falls on it. And because it does, it's bringing forth vegetation. This is what the ground was supposed to do that's been plowed and, and planted. Bring vegetation. And that one is blessed of God, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it's close to being just cursed and being burned. So you're going to heaven when you die. But you're going to stand there at the Bema seat with all the works in your hands. And God's flaming eyes that penetrate and examine will see whether or not you've built with wood, hay, and stubble or with precious metals. And if it's wood, hay, and stubble, that's all going to go up and smoke. That's what he's talking about. Just be burned up. Well, you'll just be there naked. We'll get to that in Revelation. John tells us that we're busy building our own wedding dress. It, cult, uh, the Jewish culture was much different than ours today. I don't know how many hours Becky spent making our daughter's wedding dress. It was, I don't know how many hours she spent. Today you just run down to the store and buy one. or. But that was made. The writer John tells us in 19th chapter of Revelation, you as a believer are responsible for preparing your own wedding dress. And the material in that wedding dress is the righteous acts of the saints. Your works, that's going to be in your wedding dress. And that's why there will be some standing there naked. A Jew always wore two garments. He had an inner garment and an outer garment. You and I are clothed in the inner garment of the righteousness of Jesus. The outer garment is made up of our works. And if we have no works, once his eyes of, that penetrate and examine burn up all that stuff, we'll just be standing there with a handful of soot and ash to give Jesus. That's what he's talking about. The ground just doesn't yield what it's supposed to yield. It's going to be burned up. Oh, you're going to heaven, and I have people, well, you know, it's just enough to know I'm going to heaven. You've missed the whole point of being saved, folks. The whole point for being saved. Knowing I'm going to heaven is a byproduct of my great salvation, but from there, from here to there, I'm to be conformed and molded to the image of Jesus and I am to allow the Holy Spirit to live his life out through me, producing fruit. And he's warning them here. If the ground is cultivated and the rain falls and the farmer has taken care of it, it's going to produce fruit. But if not, there's just thorns and thistles. And the only thing that's good for is to be burned up. And then in verse 9, you come to a conjunction. And I, I say this all the time. But don't underestimate that little word, but. Listen to what he's saying. He's warning them. He's warning you and me. And in the middle of that warning, but he moves from a warning 
to an encouragement. These are Christians, and he's encouraging them. That little but is a particle in the Greek of distinction. When you read it, it's distinct. He's marking it off about following what's about to follow from what he's just said. But, not like the thorns and the thistles that are going to be burned up, he's addressing them as beloved, but beloved. And the writers of the Bible never address lost people as beloved. He's talking to Christians. So maybe we ought to stop right here and ask God, how close am I to verse 3? For you saying to me, you're not going any further. How close are we? Have I gone too far? Am I in that condition? I'm just going to go through all the motions and be miserable? Miserable? The rest of my life down here? And I have met men who have been called to preach, and for whatever reason, they didn't want to do that, or they had a wife that could care less, and they didn't want to be in the ministry, and they did not surrender to the call. Miserable. They'll be miserable the rest of their life down here. But he's addressing them, and he's switching pronouns. You. That's why you need to understand in every church, there's always a church within the church. It, a Baptist church is the easiest thing in the world to join. Just walk down the aisle and join it. There are far more stricter rules than joining a civic club. You just join the church. There's always a church within a church. There are those that sit in the pews that are saved and those that are not saved. They may be members of the church. Wheat and tares. There are babies in the church with the true church. There are toddlers. There are adults. Those who crave milk and they don't care about meat. Some who choose not to grow. But the writer's encouraging them. But, and this is a, an, a beloved is a word of affection. I'm convinced of better things for you. Wow. I'm convinced of better things for you. I have confidence in you. I have assurance that you're going to press on to maturity. And the more you press on to maturity, the more settled in the word you will become and in your own security and the assurance of eternal life. Wow. I am convinced. Perfect tense verb in the Greek. Something happens at a point in time. He knew at a point in time they'd come to faith in Jesus. It's also a passive voice in the Greek. We have active and passive in English. So if, a, if it's an active voice, who does the act? Oh, English. Remember English? active voice who does that the subject does the act if it's passive voice the subject's being acted upon something is happening to the subject and because this is a passive voice in the perfect tense it's god that's going to cause the growth in you folks if you are yielded to him if you're meditating in the word if there is that desire to go on and to grow we don't all progress at the same level, but we are to progress. And he's saying, I am convinced, I am persuaded. This is a word of encouragement. One more thing. Maybe you get tired of the Greek. But again, it, it, this is a first-class conditional sentence in the Greek. And the first-class conditional says it's a reality. It will happen. If you just allow God to do that in you, that's the intended outcome. That's the intended outcome. I am convinced. 
I have that assurance that you are going to go on. Now, what is he convinced of? Better things for you. I am convinced of better things concerning you. Better than what? Back up to the first part of chapter 6. Not going on, choosing to stay on the milk bottle and not the meat. The better things of pressing on to maturity. I want to grow. I want to grow. I do. I want to grow. I am convinced of better things for you. It's a joy when a pastor sees people that have a hunger for the word and they're growing. And again, we don't all grow at the same rate. We just don't. I am convinced not only of better things concerning you, but watch this, things that are consistent with salvation. Or your translation may say a company. A company, it's a present. Uh, we're going to start a Greek Christ here in January, so if you'd like to come, you're welcome to come. It's a present participle in the Greek. Participle, do you remember participles from England? I think I've shared you with my first church. It was a little part-time church. I had an English teacher, and I got so tired of her stopping me at the church and say, listen, you have dangling participles. Well, I didn't even know what a dangling participle was. You know, an I-N-G, you, uh, uh, you don't end it in that. And I, I'm dangling all over the place. I'm just in the seminary. I'm just learning. One of my students has an English teacher in his church, and he's, and to his credit, he's always asking her, I want you to write down where I messed up grammatically, and I want you to tell me. So when he sends me his sermons, or he preached the other day, the first thing I had to say was, you messed up grammatically. Well, what does that matter? Ain't it? It does matter, folks, because people are listening to you. You're trying to communicate. All right. So a participle in the Greek describes character. It's characteristic of a person. It's present tense, which means that's continuous action. This is to be always going on in your life. Growing. That which is consistent with salvation. Boy, uh, here's one more thing. It's a middle voice. We don't have a middle voice in English. We have active and passive. Active, the subject's doing the acting. Passive, the subject's being acted upon. The middle voice in Greek means the subject is acting upon him or herself. So if I said I threw the ball, that's active voice. If I said the ball hit me, that's passive voice. But if I said I hit myself with the ball, that's a middle voice. That's something I'm doing to or for myself. And this is a middle voice here. Things that are consistent. I'm responsible for that. Growing. Maturing. Going on to maturity. I am convinced that things that accompany salvation. Boy, what a tremendous truth this is. That word accompany or consistent means to, to hold something very, to hold on to something very tightly. You're joined to it. Folks, if you're a believer, one of the evidences of your genuine salvation will be your growth and bearing fruit. That's that's not from me, that's from Scripture. If there's nothing there, you have every right to question whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus. Growth and fruit are the intended outcomes. I am convinced of this. So let, let me put it like this. If, if your pastor has to pray for you, Every day, 
How does he have to pray? What does he have to pray for? Because pastors are going to give an account to God for the way they've shepherded the flock. And the shepherd is concerned about the flock. So if somebody comes up and says, pray for me, well, what do you want me to pray about? How do I need to pray for you? Things that accompany salvation. Now, how do you know that they were produced? Look at verse 10. God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and are still ministering to the saints. Here is proof of their salvation. They are ministering to the saints. God's not going to forget that, folks. Wow. I, I, sometimes we get discouraged and depressed. I just do this and nothing's happening. I don't see. I don't know that. I had a young man that traveled with me when I was in evangelism, and one night we were coming home from a revival, and he looked at me and he said, Dr. Cliff, why do you not extend the invitation? You know, there's some evangelists that are saying 15 verses because they want somebody to come down. It makes it look good on the resume. And I said, because, Michael, that's not my job. The Holy Spirit's the one that convicts. Now, if I feel impressed to continue it, I will. But if people hadn't come after one or two verses and sometimes three, then I'm not going to linger that out. That's God's business. It's God's business. And I can trust him. And the writer is saying there are things that accompany salvation. They are consistent with salvation. And God's not going to be so unjust and unloving to forget. He's not going to neglect that. And the not in here is a is one of two negatives in the Greek, and that's a knot of absolute objectivity. He's not going to do that, folks. He will remember you have demonstrated your salvation because you ministered to the saints, and you're still ministering to the saints. Wow. Serving. The word serve is used two times. Aristides means they were doing it at a point in time, and now they are still serving present participle. They are living their faith out. They are serving. They are serving, and people don't seem to understand all of that. Wow. What a word of encouragement to these people. There are, some of them are still babies, but he's encouraging them. There are better things that are ahead of you. Wow. Now, let me bring this down a little further, folks. And this is one of the hardest things that I... When God saved you, you not only came into the family of God, but the moment he placed you in the... The moment you were saved, he gave you a spiritual gift. I'm not talking about natural talents and abilities. Those became yours at the first birth. But at the second birth, God gave you a grace gift. You had nothing to do with it. It's all of grace. It was God's gift for you intended as he willed it. But it will be consistent with you and God's purpose and plan for your life. So when he saved you, he put you into the body of Christ with your own spiritual gift. And Paul will describe those gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 in human analogy. Some are a foot, some are an eye, some are an arm, some are an ear. We don't all have the same gift, but you put all that together and you have a, in the physical realm, you have a body made up of many different parts and organs. And I can assure you, folks, if one part's not working, the rest of it's going to suffer. So bring that over into the spiritual realm. You're in this body. You may be a hand. You may be a foot. 
whatever God has so planned and willed for your life, he's put you in this spiritual body made up of many diverse parts. But every part is necessary. And if that particular part's not functioning, the body's diseased. The reason we're to function is because we are to be strengthened to obey the Great Commission. Every, every gift in place, ministry. Right? That's what he's talking about here. You are serving, you have been serving, you still are. Now, what does that mean? How does that look? I'll challenge you to go home and, and look up the little phrase, one another. There are over 60, I think, 60 times this little phrase is used. One another, minister to one another, bear one another's burdens, love one another. You cannot do that when you're separated from the body, folks. You cannot do that. You can't serve one another if you're not functioning in the body. Boy, how in the world can you obey that? As we began to grow and mature, we began to see the great salvation. And, wow. We don't all have the same gifts. I, and that's hard for us to understand. We do not all have the same gifts, so the ministry is different. But every ministry is important. Somebody with the gift of, of exhortation is important. Somebody with the gift of Mercy is important. Somebody with the gift of serving is important. Somebody with the gift of administration is important. Someone with the gift of teaching is important. And when they're all in place, the body is whole, it's strengthened. That's what he's saying to them, I am convinced of better things for you. Things that accompany salvation, they are consistent with salvation oh, what an encouragement for those that are saved what an encouragement I'm in place I may not be recognized don't have to be recognized I've shared with you several times about the dear sweet little lady at Willow Point only God in heaven knows what that little lady meant to me Never notice, never. Not out in the front, but she had the gift of service and was serving and serving. Came into my office on the brink of a, of a nervous breakdown. And I just simply said, would you please come to this church every day? There's no paid position for you here. Would you just come every day and do whatever needs to be done? From that day until the day I resigned and went into evangelism, she never, ever missed a service. I've shared that story with you. I could walk out of that pulpit, head to the back door for the benediction, as, as the benediction was being pronounced, and when I passed a certain pew, there would be that little lady with her hand extended out. Nobody saw that. They were praying. There was a, a Kleenex, rolled up Kleenex in her hand. I would take that Kleenex out, get to the back of the church, open it up, and there'd be a high-peeled peppermint in it. That's service, folks. Nobody noticed that. The only mistake she made one day when I got to the back and undid the, the Kleenex, it had her medicine in it. She gave me the wrong package that morning. Faithful. And all, again, only God in heaven knows what that little lady meant to this preacher. We're all important. All of us. I am persuaded of better things for you. Keep growing. Keep maturing. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can't do that. Because you've never been born again. You, you don't have the life of God in you to grow. If you are a believer, God's mandate is to grow in grace and knowledge don't come to a place and say that's it i'm not going any further you may wind up on the shelf or if you're if your life becomes an adverse witness to people around you 
God will just say, I'll just take you on home to heaven because you're influencing too many people the wrong way. The wrong way. Don't do that. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? If you don't, I'll give you a little test that will help you find it. But I can't do that for you inside the body. If you know what your gift is, you have to bring that gift under the authority of the Holy Spirit and allow him to empower you to use that in the body of Christ. If you've never accepted Christ, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Whether you're in the auditorium or you're watching online, dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I accept him. I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. Tim is going to lead us in the hymn of commitment. If you prayed that prayer here, you need to come forward and follow him in confessing him and following him in believer's baptism. He's dealing with you about the fact that you are a believer, but you're not growing. You're not maturing. You may be dangerously close to that place where God says I will not permit you to go on I will not permit you to go on would you come as Debbie leads us in this hymn of commitment Father thank you so much for loving us enough to not only send your son but to give us your written word words of truth and life bear fruit in our own lives today because we've heard you speak. In the strong, powerful, precious name of Christ we pray.